It is Monday, March 25th, 2013. I'm Wes Hagen, and you are overlooking the beautiful Clopepe Vineyards in the Santa Rita Hills, Santa Barbara, California. And because it's Monday, two things this week. Number one, of course, it's time for questions from uh, our Facebook page at uh, Clopepe. And uh, it's also my 44th birthday, so it's an exciting day today. I've had a very long day, but um, one thing I wanted to do on my birthday is continue to do uh, exactly what we started, which is answer your questions every Monday. So I've got five questions that we're going to fire through real quick, and here we go. So our first question today was from uh, Mike Glaze, and Mike asks about frost. Uh, we're just seeing bud break, so we're obviously very concerned about frost. Um, he asked specifically, what happens if you do have a night where it gets under 32 degrees? How do you stop the vines from uh, frying like they got hit by, uh, by basically a flamethrower, which is kind of what it looks like? The answer is we have two things we can do to stop frost. Well, three things. Number one, we want to keep the vineyard floor as clean as possible so all the cold air moves downhill so we don't have to worry about the hills. What we have to worry about is the dales. Down and below where the uh, cold air all settles, that's where we're going to have a problem with frost. So on those lowest areas, we have a basically these machines called cold air drains that have a helicopter blade inverted on a 15 horsepower motor. So when we start those up, it blows cold air from the bottom of the vineyard 300 feet up in the sky. It makes a horrible racket, but it really works pretty well and keeps us safe down to about maybe 29, 30 degrees. Uh, the other thing we do is we turn sprinklers on and we basically water the vines. Water goes over the grapes and uh, basically freezes them. So the little baby grapes are like inside their own little igloos and inside of the ice it never goes th uh, colder than 32 degrees. So at 32 degrees we're all good. Under 32 degrees we run into some problems. So we can use water, we can use fans, um, and of course uh, we can use a, a clean... Uh, uh, a clean vineyard floor, and we can try to plant uh, you know, only the hillsides of vineyards, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, so that's what happens if we have frost. So we have a frost alarm, and when the frost alarm goes off at 36 degrees, I get up, maybe have a little drink to steal myself, go out, turn the machines on, turn the sprinklers on, try to come back in, put some dry clothes on, and try to go back to bed. Uh, the second question is from Mark Simmons. Thank you for the question, Mark. He asks, uh, what constitutes an American viticultural area and what is the typicity of the small uh, American viticultural areas in uh, Santa Barbara County, which is Ballard Canyon, Santa Rita Hills, and Happy Canyon? Um, I think pretty easily you can kind of describe an American viticultural area. It's not as prescriptive as the French systems, the AOC, in which basically there's a lot more government control over what is and what isn't considered an AOC wine. Once the government gives us the American viticultural area saying if you grow uh, grapes within this boundary you can declare it as an AVA wine, the government steps back, uh, basically becomes whether or not that AVA reflects positive uh, you know, quality in the wines while in France they act, the government actually tastes and controls some of those wines to make sure that they're worthy of their AOC. So I like to call the French AOC system a prescriptive system and the American AVA system a descriptive system. Descriptive in the boundary, and then if it comes from in that boundary, it, it is an AVA wine, even though that there's no qualitative sort of um, rubric whether the wine gets in or out. Uh, Ballard Canyon, I think, really is a marginal climate, perfect for Rhone varietals. Santa Rita Hills is a very cool climate region, specifically for Burgundian varietals and Alsatian varietals. Happy Canyon is a very warm area. So Happy Canyon is like region 3 to 4, Ballard Canyon is 2 to 3, and Santa Rita Hills is barely a region 1, which means there's part of Santa Rita Hills that wouldn't be even considered by the Davis, uh, the Winkler system, as even a wine grape growing region. It's just too cold. That's why sometimes we don't even get Chardonnay uh, quite ripe here at, uh, in Santa Rita and at, at Clopepe. So uh, I don't want to get too much. I can talk about AVAs for hours, but... Happy Canyon, I think, is really great for Sauvignon Blanc, and the typicity is making these beautiful Sauvignon Blancs that don't really have a lot of that uh, gooseberry, unripe uh, kind of green character. They're more a little bit, uh, they're crisp, but they also have a really luscious fruit component to them that I love. Santa Rita Hills, all about the cool temperature and the marine influence. And, of course, Ballard Canyon is a magical region that we're just starting to understand. So, Mike, that's a little bit more. If you want more on AVAs, let me know. That's what I'm going to spend on it today. Eve Bushman, uh, who wrote a great blog. If you've never read it, Eve on Wine is wonderful. Uh, what's West drinking today? Well, it's not going to be wine. I kind of wined out last night. I had a 1994 Fox in Sanford and Benedict Pinot Noir, and I said in, uh, on my uh, Facebook, it, it drank just like uh, Nina Simone sings. It was, it was 
flavorful and it was smoky and it was sensual and it was just absolutely gorgeous and complex. And uh, so we've been drinking wine the last 24 hours with meals. I think tonight is about kicking back and just having a cocktail. So this is kind of my new favorite tequila. This is called Casa Noble or Castle Noble. Uh, the Casa Noble tequila drinks, even though uh, it's considered an Anejo and it's been laid down, I think, for three years in wood, it almost has an agave sense like, uh, like a silver tequila. Absolutely gorgeous. And uh, both of these liquors were given to me by my friend Carla Elman. So thank you, Carla. I really appreciate it. And this is a very special bottle uh, of 18-year-old Highland Park. And normally I'm a 12-year Highland Park guy, but it was given to me as a gift, which I thought was just so what lovely. And it's uh, it's distilled in Kirkwall in Orkney, and it's uh, it's an island scotch called a Highland Park, but it's not actually a Highland scotch, which was confusing. So I'll probably have a little scotch and a little tequila tonight, but just enough to be celebratory and not to be stupid. So that was uh, what's West drinking today. Uh, may open some bubbles uh, if Chanda feels like drinking, because Chanda, my wife, obviously loves the bub. So that's also a possibility. Moving on to question number four, Tom O'Higgins, who's actually related, I think the great, 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 great grandfather of Bernardo O'Higgins, who actually uh, liberated um, some uh, uh, liberated Chile, believe it or not. Uh, and it goes, uh, there's actually a combination with Chile and the Santa Rita Hills that I won't get into. But Tom O'Higgins, one of my favorite guys, and he's obviously always gets a really good uh, reception when he visits Chile with a name like O'Higgins. Uh, when do certain cultural practices get scheduled um, according to the AVA or the area they were in? And he's like, when do you prune? Does Happy Canyon prune different than Santa Rita Hills? The key is, is to prune as late as possible in a frost prone area. So the earliest, if you prune too early, the vines wake up too early. So all of the different AVAs probably keep a lot of their scheduling when in, during dormancy about the same. We usually start pruning late December, early, uh, early January, and we finish pruning in, usually in March. But the later we can prune, the later the vines wake up. Why do we want the vines to wake up late? It goes back to the first question. We're trying to keep the vines from frosting. So while the vines are dormant, they're basically immune to frost. And when they wake up and you have green material, suddenly they can all fry and get frosted. So uh, we do want to prune as late as possible. So Happy Canyon could prune later than we do because uh, Cabernet, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc may be waking up pretty early, but th those other grapes need some time. So um, in general, most things are happening sort of concurrently. But once the growing season starts, all the different, uh, everything goes out the window. Every AVA has a different schedule because the growth of the vines is going to be much different depending on if it's a cool climate, a marginal climate, or a hot climate. Uh, so you're going to see different uh, cultural practices in different vineyards at different times. Generally, though, there's stuff you do in the spring, stuff you do in the summer, stuff you do in the fall. And that's about as accurate as we can get uh, using all different regions together. And the last question was from Lannon, Lannon Rust. And Lannon uh, asked a question before, so thanks for sending the questions, Lannon. And he asks, what does it mean to be light-handed in your winemaking? Or do you agree that the minimal manipulation in winemaking is the best way to go? And no, I like to say that uh, you know, non-interventionist winemakers can only make one of two products, and that is raisins or vinegar. Uh, everything I do when I wake up in the morning till I go to sleep is a manipulation of what I'm attempting to do with the grapes and the wine here. Not to say that I want to take away the typicity that's given by these beautiful hills and this beautiful climate behind me, but my focus is what can I do to grow the best grapes, to manipulate the grape canopy, to manipulate, to manipulate the fermentation, to herd the yeast into the, into the ways that they should be going, to make the best wines that it's not about my affectation, but it is about my manipulation. And I, you need to know the difference between manipulation and affectation. Affectation is craft. Manipulation is more a person trying to put their personal statement in the wine. I'm not about, I think my statement is more about what the vineyard wants to speak in, uh, in a vintage. So I don't like the term non-manipulative non or non-interventionist. We intervene every day. And if you're not intervening every day as a winemaker, uh, I'm wondering what you're really doing to, fit, uh, to spend your time. So we choose barrels, we choose cultural practices, we cho choose a crew, we choose when to do everything in the winery. Every single one of those is a manipulation. So I'm not a believer in non-manipulation. I am a, a believer in trying to keep my affectation from obscuring vintage and obscuring varietal and balance. So that's it. Send in more questions at Wes Hagen, at Clo Peppy, uh, the Clo Peppy fan page. Really appreciate everyone listening to what I have to say. Try to stump me. I love the tough questions. Bring it on. Let's have some fun. Have a great night and happy birthday to me.